Good day, everyone. My name is Kerry Leisha, and welcome to X Africa's latest webcast. In today's presentation, we will be exploring the interrelated topics of climate change, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, specifically goal number seven, and the opportunity of renewable energy in Africa. This presentation is based off three analysis briefings compiled by X Africa over the last six months. These briefings have been collated into one larger report that is now available alongside this presentation. As the world unites to combat the rapid spread of the novel coronavirus, we at X Africa have noticed that there are many similarities that may be drawn and lessons learned from the world's response to this current catastrophic event and to how we plan to combat global warming over the coming decades. It is for this reason that we are pausing to reflect on this long-term challenge and specifically how the African continent is faring in this regard. In the first section of this presentation, we will be looking at Africa's response to climate change. We will see that despite being a small contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions, Sub-Saharan Africa has already shown promising initiative in the fight against global warming. However, it will also become evident that without a greater commitment from the global community, these efforts will ultimately be for naught, as the continent stands the risk of being the most impacted by global warming over the coming century. Let's begin by taking a look at the continent's contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. At the global level, the region's overall contribution is comparatively small amounting to around 4% of the world's total in 2017. Having said that, the largest emitter across the continent, which is South Africa, is in fact the 14th largest emitter globally. Other major emitters in Africa include Nigeria, Ethiopia, Sudan, Tanzania, Angola, Cameroon, Kenya, Chad, and the Central African Republic. The highest contributing sectors across the continent, as they are across the rest of the world, are of course energy, agriculture, industrial processes, and waste. Having looked at Africa's contribution to global warming, let's have a look at its pledges at the global level to turning this around. In doing so, we need to turn our attention to the 2015 Paris Agreement, which is an agreement within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that deals with greenhouse gas emissions, mitigation, adaptation, and finance. The agreement's long-term goal is to keep the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius by 2100, and to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius in the same period. Before the agreement was signed, countries around the world were required to submit intended national determined contributions or INDCs, in which they stipulated how they would limit the increase in global average temperatures. Across Africa, all countries submitted their INDCs at the time. Following the agreement, countries are now required to submit ratified national determined contributions, or NDCs, every five years, beginning this year, to ensure that global efforts stay on track. Africa has also fared well here, as almost all sub-Saharan African countries have submitted to their NDCs, with the exceptions of Angola, Senegal, and South Sudan. While this is all well and good, studies have unfortunately shown that the world's current commitments are already falling short of limiting the global temperature rise as envisioned in the Paris Agreement. Alarmingly, under the current pledges, the world's temperatures will still rise by 2.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. As such, countries around the world have been asked to submit revised NDCs this year in a global effort to course correct. Africa has again fallen into line here, where to date at least 30 African states have indicated their intention to enhance their NDCs this year, including the major economies of South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia and Kenya. Out of these countries, it is worth noting that Kenya is already on track to meet 
or even overachieve its Paris Agreement pledge, but nevertheless intends to improve its commitments in 2020, along with submitting a long-term, low-carbon development strategy. As demonstrated so far, Sub-Saharan Africa does not house the biggest emitter globally, but its states have nevertheless taken worthy significant steps to combat the continent's contributions to global greenhouse gas emissions. However, without significant pledges from the rest of the global community, and particularly from the largest emitters, Sub-Saharan Africa's efforts will be for naught. There are a number of complicating factors that need to be considered here. Firstly, any rise in global average temperature will have an amplified effect across Africa, as temperature rises across the continent may be as much as one and a half times more than the global average. Secondly, the continent is expected to be the most vulnerable to climate change in the long term. According to the University of Notre Dame, which compiles a vulnerability to climate change index, all 20 of the most vulnerable nations globally are located in Africa. These states are listed on the slide. Moving on to the economic effects of climate change, the Brookings Institution estimates that climate change resulting in a three degrees Celsius temperature increase, which we're currently on track for, will cause Africa's GDP to contract by as much as 8.6% per year after 2100. Even if climate change is limited to one and a half degrees Celsius, GDP will still decrease per year, but at a slower rate of 3.8% after 2100. Taking this all into account, it is clear that much more so than any other region, Africa has a vested interest in leading by example by updating their NDCs this year and keeping the Paris Agreement on track. As Africa looks to step up its efforts, it's worth recalling here that progress in the fight against climate change is also enshrined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 13, for example, specifically calls for urgent action against climate change to be taken. This now leads us to the second part of our presentation, in which we will track the continent's progress in terms of the UN SDGs, and specifically goal number seven, and how this impacts climate change. In 2015, during the same year as the Paris Agreement, the UN set out a collection of broad-based and interdependent global goals designed to help achieve a better and more sustainable future for all by a global deadline of 2030. Known collectively as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, these goals focus on ways to eradicate poverty, improve education, realize gender equality, fight climate change, and improve energy access. Specifically, UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven calls for ensuring universal access to affordable, reliable, and importantly for our purposes, sustainable energy services, particularly to electrification. Given the connection between climate change and energy, the second part of our presentation will examine Africa's progress in realizing this goal. In doing so, it will become clear that despite significant progress in electrification to date, without a major step, by African cha step change for African governments over the coming decade, the majority of the continent will fail to meet this target, hindering the realization of our other UN Sustainable Development Goals, including our commitment to combating global climate change. Let's begin by taking a look at how the world and Africa are faring when it comes to goal number seven. At the global level, there has been significant progress in electrification rates since 2010. The share of the global population with access to electricity rose from 83% in 2010 to 89% in 2017. This increase amounted to newly gained access to electricity for some 920 million people across the world, with some 150 million people gaining access to electricity each year since 2015. Africa has also shown significant progress. Across the continent, the electricity access gained 
by nearly 450 million people pushed up the regional access rate from just 39% in 2015 to the current 44%. In addition, electrification rates have actually outstripped population growth rates in Africa since 2015. Despite this progress, however, numerous challenges across the continent remain. Firstly, Africa is home to the largest access energy deficit. As mentioned, the regional electricity access rate across Sub-Saharan Africa is currently 44%. While this has presented a vast improvement on previous rates, it also means that Sub-Saharan Africa's access rate is now the largest in the world, surpassing Latin America and Southeast Asia, where an estimated 573 million people are currently without access to electricity across the continent. A quick look at the top 20 access deficit country, countries globally on the screen clearly demonstrates this gap. 16 of the countries with the biggest access deficits are in Africa and include major economies like Nigeria, Ethiopia, Angola, and Kenya. In another blow to the continent, Sub-Saharan Africa is also home to many of the least electrified countries globally. In fact, the 20 least electrified countries across the world are all located in Africa. Looking at this data, some shocking results emerge. Firstly, the first 11 countries in the table have an access rate of just 25%, meaning that three quarters of their population do not have access to electricity at the moment. Secondly, it is evident that both landlocked and coastal states are included in this bottom 20 list. Where some have previously argued that landlocked states are disadvantaged in terms of electrification, this table shows otherwise, as the likes of Sierra Leone, Madagascar, Mozambique, and Tanzania are all included. Finally, the table seems to include both conflict-prone and peaceful economies, suggesting that this is not necessarily a factor as well. Now, while all of this sounds exceptionally grim, these two data points I've presented fail to demonstrate the significant progress that has been made and is being achieved across the continent, even in the countries facing the biggest challenges. Importantly, Africa is also home to some of the fastest electrifying countries across the world. The table on the screen shows these fastest electrifying countries globally, and within this global pool, seven African countries make the cut. Most interestingly, some of these countries here also featured in the last two tables. Kenya, for example, had some of the biggest access deficits in the world, but is also the third fastest electrifying country globally. In addition, Rwanda, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic were all listed as part of the least electrified countries but now also feature in the countries electrifying the fastest. The table further demonstrates that African countries have been able to achieve high annual increases in both the early and late stages of the electrification process. On the one end of the spectrum, for example, Swaziland, with an access rate of 73.5%, is still achieving a 4% annual increase, whilst the Central African Republic with an access rate of just 30%, and thus also within the 20 least electrified countries list, is achieving an almost 3% annual increase in access. It's worth noting here that the global annual average access rate is just 0.8%, demonstrating the vast achievement of these countries. So what does this all mean for the world and Africa's realization towards Goal number seven by 2030. Unfortunately, at the global level, current electrification rates are actually falling short of what is required to realize universal access by 2030. Based on the current trajectory, it is estimated that 92% of the global population will have access to electricity by the 2030 deadline, 
leaving some 650 million people without access. Most importantly for us, nine out of 10 of these people will be based in Sub-Saharan Africa. Across the whole of Africa, North Africa is the only African region on track to achieve the targeted electrification rate of 100% by 2030. There is also some indication that East Africa might realize this target, but only under highly optimistic scenarios. Overall, over the next decade, electrification is actually expected to become much more difficult for all, as many of the lower hanging fruits have already been captured in many countries. In particular, efforts now need to shift to those who are hardest to reach, such as those living in remote areas and in marginalized and rapidly growing urban and slum communities. This now brings us to the third and final part of our presentation, where we will explore the potential of renewable energy in Africa, as many argue that the answer to overcoming this last stretch in electrification and realization of our global climate change goals lies in the rapid deployment of renewable energy across the African continent. The development of renewable energy is central to the realization of UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven and ultimately a reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions towards 2100. Many of the biggest economies in Africa have come to realize this and are actively opening up investment opportunities in this space in their countries. In the final leg of our presentation, we'll look at the development of the sector in the continent's largest economies of Nigeria, South Africa and Kenya. We'll also look at what some of the smaller economies are doing and what the general risks are in the road ahead. Let's begin with Nigeria. While Nigeria is endowed with vast natural resources that could be harnessed for renewable power, this potential remains largely un untapped. Of its installed capacity, for example, between 80 to 85 percent of electricity generation currently comes from thermal power. In an attempt to turn this around and address massive electricity shortfalls in the country, which we have already explored, the government has developed several plans to ensure growth in renewables, in renewables over the next decade. Central to this is the country's Renewable Energy Master Plan, which intends to increase the share of renewable energy in the country's energy mix to 10% by 2025 and 20 to 30% by 2030. While hydropower is the main source of renewable energy in Nigeria today, given the risk of droughts, the country is looking to diversify its energy resource mix with a strong focus on solar. Over 2017 and 2018, for example, the country invested more than 20 billion US dollars in solar power projects. The renewable sector has also proven its worth in terms of employment opportunities in the country. According to a job census report compiled by Power for All, which is a local NGO, growth in the renewable energy sector is already having a positive spin-off in terms of job creation, where the sector's work workforce is now comparable with traditional power grids and utilities in Nigeria. The sector currently employs 4,000 people, for example, compared to 10,000 employed across the country's traditional energy sectors. Most importantly, jobs in the renewable energy sector are expected to grow by 100% in the next four years. Turning our attention to South Africa, according to South Africa's Ministry of Energy, around 91.2% of electricity generation currently comes from thermal power, whilst only 8.8% comes from renewables. This despite the country boasting considerable opportunities in this regard. You'll recall here that South Africa was the 14th largest emitter of global greenhouse gases. However, the release of the country's long-awaited integrated resource plan in 2019 has the potential to change this. This plan maps out the scale and pace of new electricity generation capacity to be commissioned until 2030 and has a very strong focus on renewables. In particular, 
It stipulates that 48% of new energy capacity must now come from wind, 20% from solar, 10% from gas, and 8% from hydro. In addition, independent power producers are expected to largely fill this gap, given the current constraints of the national utility, ESCOM, of course. Further benefiting the private sector, the growth in renewables will also have the potential to kickstart manufacturing in this regard, as South Africa looks to become a manufacturing base for renewable components, with a view to export to the rest of Africa over the medium term as well. Kenya constitutes the last of our big economies, and this country really leads the way in exploiting renewable energy sources in Africa. Renewable energy already constitutes 85% of the country's energy mix, largely driven by geothermal and hydro sources. The next 10 years promise to provide even more opportunity in this regard. In particular, Kenya has a stated goal of 100% renewable energy generation by 2030. Although hydropower contributes significantly to production at the moment, given the risk of drought, the government is looking to enhance solar, wind, thermal, and geothermal generation in its long-term plans. One of the ways in which the government is ensuring this is by entering into major public-private partnerships. This was demonstrated in August 2019, when the Kenyan Investment Authority and Meru County, County Government entered into a memorandum of understanding with global renewable energy developers to build Africa's first large-scale hybrid wind, solar, and battery storage project known as the Meru County Energy Project. The growth of renewables is also expected to have a significant impact on the job market, as witnessed in Nigeria. According to Power for All, decentralized renewable energy companies in Kenya currently account for 10,000 jobs, only 1,000 fewer than the national utility. In addition, these jobs are expected to grow by 70% over the next four years. Beyond the top three economies, there are also some bright spots across the rest of the continent. Ghana, for example, has its own renewable energy master plan that sets out the blueprint for power production until 2030. Under this plan, Ghana aims to increase installed renewable capacity from 42.5 megawatts recorded in 2015 to a whopping 1,364 megawatts by 2030. Ethiopia is also looking to harness renewable energy. Despite its large energy potential, the country experiences major energy shortages as it struggles to serve a population of over 100 million people and meet growing electricity demand that is forecasted to grow by approximately 30% per year. You'll recall here that Ethiopia featured in our largest deficits and least electrified countries table. Ethiopia's growth and transformation plans one and two seek to rectify this. As they outline multi-year plans to transform the country into a middle income country by 2025 and to starkly increase electricity generation, particularly through hydropower, but also through solar power and wind. Sub-Saharan Africa's smaller economies also present significant opportunities. The five countries with the highest renewable energy investment as a percentage of GDP globally, for example, are all emerging or developing economies. From Sub-Saharan Africa, Rwanda and Guinea-Bissau make this list. Other smaller economies that have also set renewable energy targets, demonstrating a commitment to the development of the sector, include Cape Verde, Djibouti and Swaziland. Having reviewed renewable energy plans in Africa, it is clear that from the continent's largest economies to its smallest, there is a focus on the development of such energy across the continent, and most importantly, that the private sector has a key role to play. Ultimately, the growth of renewables promises to not only plug the gap with regard to electricity generation, but to help the continent achieve its climate goals, the main issue of this presentation. While the opportunities and the challenges will differ from market to market, 
Investors should nevertheless always recall the major country risk challenges that may present themselves. Across countries, these may include the weak or underdeveloped regulatory environment in the renewable energy sector, shifting energy policies under new regimes, the creditworthiness of state-owned utility companies, corruption and or political pressure, security threats in remote locations, lack of financing for projects, and contestation over land. Our current country risk ratings for every country as of the second quarter of 2020 is up on the screen to provide a snapshot of the highest and lowest risk countries to invest in this year. This now brings us to the end of our webcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening to our insights. As always, if you have any questions regarding the presentation, please don't hesitate to contact us at insight at xafrica.com. From everyone at XAfrica, we hope that you stay safe and healthy during this period, wherever you are.